share a couple of um, scripture readings with you. And uh, the first one comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 27 through... I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. I'm sorry I got my two readings turned around. <laughs> and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his garments became glistening, intensely white, as no fuller on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And then I would also like to read a separate account of the transfiguration found in Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his countenance was altered and his raiment became dazzling white. And behold, two men talked with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but kept awake, and they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting with him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he said this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. And when the voices had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silence and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. So, uh, what I'd like to talk about today is the transfiguration, which I call the beginning of the end. Now, in addition to the, uh, the scriptures that I read, wh which talk about the actual transfiguration, there is a little bit of a background uh, that kind of helps to fill in a little bit of uh, details here. And that is uh, found in um, uh, Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 33. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you're the Christ. And he charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. 
But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. <clears throat> so this incident at Caesarea Philippi happened shortly before the transfiguration. Um, in this experience, of course, we had Peter's confession on one hand, and then wouldn't you know with Peter, he has to follow it up with something that sort of hit the other side of the scale. And this was when Christ first introduced his teaching about the fact that he had to die. Now, I can well imagine that after this experience, Peter, James, and John would have been walking along and possibly having a little discussion. They might say, well, what, is, what, what does Jesus mean when he's talking about approaching the end? And he said something about going to Jerusalem. Uh, I'm not sure that's such a good idea. You know, that's kind of the center of where you might run into a little bit of trouble. Well, about this time, Jesus interrupts him and asks him to follow him up the mountain. So, let's follow them up the mountain in order to see the meaning of the transfiguration. We'll look at it from three different perspectives. First of all, we'll look at it with the three disciples. That's Peter, James, and John. Then there were the two men. Elijah and Moses, and the one witness, the cloud. So you have the situation where you had kind of the followers of Jesus, which you might call the outer circle. Then you had the 12 disciples, which you'd call the circle. And then you had Peter, James, and John. Well, they kind of got a little bit of extra attention. Uh, so you might call them the inner circle. So Jesus started out basically kind of uh, uh, appealing to many people and going around and preaching to many, but he set aside these 12 to become his special disciples and then worked especially with Peter, James, and John and as you probably know, he had to work a little extra hard with Peter at times. So, we can look at some experiences that Peter, James, and John were involved in over, over his ministry. There was the raising of Jairus' daughter and also the raising of Lazarus, which indeed showed that Jesus had the power over death. Then, of course, we have this transfiguration, which revealed his glory. Not too long after that, you had Gethsemane, which revealed the agony. And Peter, James, and John were also very much involved in the resurrection. They were the ones to go to the tomb and to witness that it was empty. So, let's kind of imagine that Peter, James, and John were going up to the mountain with Jesus. By the time they got to the top, they were whipped. I mean, this was, this was a long ways up. So Jesus was talking about, um, you know, going to prayer. Because, you know, Jesus often kind of removed himself uh, and, and had those special times of prayers in the wilderness or in the mountain or away from the crowds. So he gets up there and he prays. So I can imagine Peter might have yawned and, and mentioned that Jesus was praying and how, you know, they ought to pray. And James said, well, you know, this has been quite a, a hard trek up here and, and uh, boy, we're kind of worn out. So they kind of drift off to sleep. Then all of a sudden, their sleep is totally interrupted because Jesus was transformed before them. 
This process came from within, revealing his glory. Now, there's a couple of different ways we could look at this experience. We could see it as an experience that was looking backwards, um, a temporary lifting of the veil so that its hidden glory came through and uh, revealed the revealing of his pre-existing glory. That's one way we could look at it. Another way of looking at it is we could be kind of forward-looking. Jesus revealed in the body of his second coming a sort of a sneak preview of the future. And then we take a look at the fact that transformation is also a part of our understanding of our Christian faith. For example, in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, you have, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that, you're, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then also Paul in 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So transformation uh, is also and a part of our understanding of our Christian faith. Now, let's take a look at the two men, Moses and Elijah. These two men had much in common with Jesus. Each of them had experiences with God on a mountain. Moses... Um, was, was on the mountain uh, when he uh, came to the end of his time. And uh, in Exodus 24, verses 15 to 18, we read, Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. Notice, the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. And Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So we have his experience. Then Elijah was on Mount Horeb in 1 Kings 19.8, we read. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. So we had mountain experiences, uh, not only with Jesus here on Transfiguration, but also Moses on Mount Sinai and Elijah on Mount Horeb. Each had endured supernatural fast of 40 days. Moses for 40 days, Elijah for 40 days, and also Jesus in the wilderness, 40 days. Each had been removed from the world in an unusual way. Now, when Moses passed away, the archangel Michael and the devil had a debate over Moses. A Moses' body, excuse me. And Elijah, he got a free ride in the chariot. And then, of course, Christ with the resurrection and ascension. So, they had that in common. Now, Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. 
They're a reminder to us that Jesus came to complete the revelation of God and was therefore the fulfillment of the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah. Now, they had a conversation up there at the transfiguration. Luke gives us a clue here. They talked about Jesus' coming exodus, which included his death, resurrection, and ascension. Moses and Elijah helped to validate Jesus' interpretation of the Messiah as the suffering servant. I'll bet this was a, a rather happy reunion for the three of them. I'm sure that Jesus received strength from these dear old saints. They helped him to steadfastly face the cross. Now, Peter's impetuous reply. Dear Peter, he's always speaking first and thinking later. Many of us are aware of some of the incidents that this was true. Peter never lacked for words. Uh, you remember that when Christ was washing the disciples' feet, oh, he wasn't going to have anything to do with that. Uh, you know, that just wasn't right at all. And Jesus said, well, if I don't, you have no part of me. Then his reaction just totally goes the other way. Not only my feet, but also my whole body. And, and uh, you remember that uh, in the incident we read about earlier that uh, Peter uh, declared that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. And then he later that same time rebuked Jesus, and Jesus had to rebuke him. So again, uh, this is Peter. And you remember when uh, the band came to uh, carry Jesus away uh, to when he was on Gethsemane, that Peter cut off a servant's ear. And then, of course, after that, Peter denied Jesus three times. So, Peter had a tendency to, uh, to act first and think later. Now, Peter's comment to build three booths or tents was somewhat inept. God didn't want this to be just another pilgrimage center. And it wasn't like, well, some of us might think, well, let's take a trip to the, the Holy Land. That would be like a pilgrimage. Or if you're a Muslim, you would, you're supposed to take a pilgrimage to Mecca at least one time in your life. Uh, God didn't want this to become a pilgrimage. Um, and it was also off-center. He put Christ on the same level. So he's got, he was making equal um, booths for Moses, Elijah, and Jesus as if they were all equal. And yet that was not true. Now, in our own day, we're, we're well aware that there are many people who, are, who will sort of say, well, uh, yeah, Jesus can come along for the trip, you know, He's, he, was a good, uh, he was a good man, and he said a lot of good things, uh, and we can look up to him, but they don't see him as the Son of God. Now, Peter tried to build the tents on the basis of glory, this glorious experience, but Jesus was to build the church on the basis of sacrifice not glory. Well, Peter, when he got a little older, also got a little wiser. So Peter looked back on this many years later as a seasoned preacher of the gospel. So I'm going to uh, read a short, short selection from 2 Peter uh, 1, 16 to 18. Um, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
but we were eyewitness of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We heard this voice born from heaven, and we were with him on the holy mountain. So, Peter's looking back on this experience many years later, and, and sees it in a little different perspective. So, what did this transfiguration mean to the disciples? It was a confirmation to the disciples that Jesus' concept of being the suffering servant was true. God sometimes shows us he's working in spite of our inabilities, in our inability to see. He was preparing them for the dark days ahead. He comes out at Philippi and he first introduces the idea that he was going to have to die and rise again. So this is preparing them to see that this is coming. Now, an illustration of this preparation, um, I think back uh, about the, the book Pilgrim's Progress, and in that, Christian stops in at the resting stop where the interpreter shows him the great mysteries of the faith in order to prepare him for his long trip. So I think in the same way Jesus was doing this with the disciples. Then we have the one witness, that is the cloud. Now, the Old Testament gives quite a um, rendering of this in its history. God came to the people in a cloud on many occasions. Now, we read about Moses and Mount Sinai. Uh, also, the fact that the cloud was leading them when they were going through the wilderness. And then at the dedication of Solomon's temple, the cloud appeared. The Jews felt that when Messiah returned, uh, the cloud of God's presence would return to the temple. The cloud was then, as here, the vehicle of God's presence. The Hebrew for this is Shekinah, the uh, presence of God's glory. The voice of God. Now, we remember back at his baptism when God spoke when he was baptized. This, the voice of baptism marked the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Then God's voice also appeared in the transfiguration. So here, the voice at the transfiguration marks the beginning of the end, the beginning of his end trip to the cross. For this time on, Jesus walked consciously under the shadow of the cross. God said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. This was the witness that really counted. God continued to work out his plan for man's redemption. And the meaning for Christ in this experience, I think we could say that he received a double approval here. First of all, he had Moses and Elijah uh, who were revealing that this was a climax in history and the consummation of God's plan. And then, of course, you had the approval of God, which was, of course, the most important approval, and it gave Jesus the go-ahead signal. Jesus saw not only the inevitability of the cross, but also the rightness of the cross. Realize that difficulty in bearing our sins was lying ahead of him. The rest of the ministry, guided by the principles of the suffering servant, he resolutely went towards his death. 
So, in conclusion, the significance of the transfiguration, it was a crisis experience which marked the end of the general public ministry and the beginning of the long trek up to Calvary. Transfiguration stressed the sacrificial character of his mission. Soon, the soon coming of his death and his mission as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. It is a focal point in the revelation of the kingdom of God, for it looks back to the Old Testament and shows how Christ fulfills it and looks forward to the great event of the cross, the resurrection, ascension, and the parousia, which is the second coming. May God add his blessing at this time. Amen.